Stanford University. Welcome to W380, Winter 2011-2012. I'm Andy Freeman. The other course organizer is Dennis Allison. We're approaching the end of the quarter, so if you're taking the class for credit, please be caught up. Remember, no incompletes. Um, we've talked a lot about large systems and scalable systems, but we haven't talked much, if at all, about rapidly growing systems. And rapid growth is the goal of most startups. But it can be extremely hard, both financially and technically. Today's speaker, Ted Modulewski of Dropbox, had the good fortune to have extremely rapid demand growth. And today's talk is about how Dropbox dealt with the technical challenges with very minimal resources. Thanks. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Modulewski, and um, I'm the server team lead at Dropbox. Uh, server team is a little bit of a historical name, uh, as I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but we're responsible for the architecture and evolution of the Dropbox backend, which is what I'm here to talk to you guys today about. Uh, so the rough structure of the talk is first an introduction about what this talk is, then uh, some background about Dropbox, what Dropbox is, what kinds of technical challenges we face, uh, which will give some insight into the third part examples of things that we've had to scale over time, going into like a fair amount of detail so you can see both what we did and all the other things that we considered that we could have done but and why we didn't choose to do those. And then a, uh, a short wrap up at the end. Um, if you guys have questions, feel free at any time just to, uh, just to bring them up. All right, so jumping right into it, what is this talk? Uh, as he mentioned, uh, there's a lot of talks a lot of information about out there about what do big systems look like? You know, how do the Googles and Facebooks of the world, how do they, what do they have at this point? Um, but it doesn't help you a whole lot when you're starting off by yourself or with maybe one other person and you have nothing and you have to get from there to having a lot. That, you know, if you wanted to build Dropbox now just with two people, I mean, one option in theory is you could take Google's infrastructure and build it on that, but there's only one company in the world that has that option, and that's Google. So what do you do if you're not them? How do you get there? Uh, there's a lot of things I could talk about that would fall into this category about how to work at a startup, uh, how to, like what things you have to worry about. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the technical ones related to back-end engineering. Uh, so this is a talk about what it's like to work on a fast-changing back-end in a very quickly growing environment uh, where your resources are growing at the same time as the demands, and you can't necessarily sort of start with the solution, the final solution. And I think this is, should be interesting. Uh, this was the talk that I wish I had gotten while I was still in school, because um, you know you you learn how to build big table, you learn how to build GFS, uh, and then you go and you realize that it's just you, and you don't have five man years to invest like they did in one of these projects. Uh, so. If you actually want to start a startup, I hope that this is interesting in terms of uh, letting you know how you might actually go and do that and what it might look like in terms of the technical background. Because uh, as I said, there's a lot more. You can take entire classes. I'm sure they have them here at Stanford about how to actually, how to actually do startups. Uh, and this part is one that I think doesn't really get covered that much, which is the technical back-end aspect. So, um, First, uh, a little bit of background about Dropbox. So uh, just by show of hands, how many people here use Dropbox? Cool. So that's uh, most people. Uh, if you don't use Dropbox, that's OK. Welcome to Silicon Valley. Uh, you will soon. Um, but what is, so what is Dropbox? Dropbox is, our goal is to make it really simple for you to get your files, your data, anywhere you want them, anytime you want them. And the way we do that right now is with our main sync product, which is a, uh, a client that runs on your desktop or laptop or your computer. And it uploads all the changes as you make them to files in your Dropbox. Um, there's a, yeah, as for scale, there's a tens of millions of people who are using this. 
and who are syncing hundreds of millions of files a day. Uh, so I'm going into this because there's actually some very interesting implications in terms of what we have to do on the back end to support something like this. That there are very different back end choices that we have to make compared to companies such as Facebook, who, uh, not to pick on them or anything, but just that we offer very different services that have very different requirements. Uh, and there's, there's a lot in involved in this that, you know, how do you write a, a small client that doesn't take up too many resources? How do you deal with low uh, bandwidth to like min most people's homes? Uh, how do you build a mobile app that runs in an even more resource constrained environment? But again, this is a talk mostly about the back end challenges. And there's two in particular that I think are most, uh, most interesting for the back end architecture. The first is the, uh, the write volume. That uh, most, most applications, most web applications especially, have an extremely high read to write ratio just because people consume more content than they produce. And so uh, I believe Twitter has like, I forget if it was 100 to 1 or 1,000 to 1, something like that, of tweets read versus tweeted. Uh, what's interesting about the way we've built Dropbox, though, is everyone's computers has a complete copy of their entire Dropbox. And this means that we basically have a multi-petabyte cache sitting in front of our service. So normal rules of thumb about cacheability kind of get thrown out of the window because we're measuring our cache in petabytes. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so it turns out that our read to write ratio is roughly one to one. When you look at, when you measure that in terms of uh, the two main client endpoints of uploading files versus downloading files. Uh, so this means, another way of thinking about this is for the same number of servers, we're doing maybe 10 to 100 times as many writes as other companies are. So this is very interesting implications because many sort of best practices or standard solutions are designed for you know, a different order of magnitude on, in terms of writes. Another interesting thing is uh, our service in our service, we can't be wrong as uh, we don't have as much leeway to sort of play with people's expectations. That um, in certain other services, you know, it might be fine to see one person's comments before another and then later see it appear above them. No one's going to say your service is broken if that happens. I mean, they won't be happy, but they won't say it's broken. But there's lots of sort of horror scenarios you can imagine for Dropbox that let's say you delete a file from a folder because you don't want to share it, but you want to share the rest of the folder. And then you share that folder, and then you check, and you see that the file is still in the folder, and then everyone you just shared with could see it. That would fundamentally break what people thought Dropbox was doing, and we just can't be wrong in that kind of scenario. Uh, so in, in technical terms, uh, from the database world, uh, these are referred to as the ACID properties, uh, referring to atomicity, um, Consistency, why am I, uh, sorry, uh, isolation for I and durability for D. Uh, and we have to be very careful about how much we can trade off any of those. That atomicity, you know, people don't want to put in a large home video for us to say we synced it and then only get half of it on the other side. Um, isolation, unfortunately, sorry, consistency also, as I mentioned, we can't really trade off that much on and we have to do a lot of things right. And also because you might, it's very often that you're updating files in the same Dropbox for multiple computers at the same time. Uh, isolation, we're allowed to trade off a little bit more. Uh, we have to so that you can do offline operation, like those two are kind of directly opposed, doing offline operation and isolation. Uh, but durability is something that we absolutely cannot trade off on. Uh, so as a whole, we have much higher requirements in terms of the correctness of all of this than many other services out there. Uh, so the combination of these two things of very high consistency and correctness requirements with a very high write throughput um, is sort of one of, if not the hard problems in uh, distributed systems these days. And this is not just, you know, something that we're building internally to uh, have for ourselves for development. This is actually core to our service. This is what we are providing to other people. And these are, the, uh, these are the expectations that we just can't play around with because 
that's the situation. Um, oh, this is not very nice. Okay, so uh, so that's some background about Dropbox. What our uh, what our setup is uh, and what our requirements are. Are there any any questions about that before I go on? Cool. So um, I'm going to go into some specific examples of things that have evolved over time. So uh, the first one is just the high-level architecture of our backend in terms of what services we have, how many of them we have, how they're connected, and stuff like that. So let's say it's 2007, and you are starting a startup with someone else, and you want to build a file syncing startup. What would you make your initial architecture look like? Would you go and build GFS and put it on that, or what would you do? Something simpler and faster to get the software guys going. Yeah, yeah. So how, how simple do you think you can make it? Put corresponding to, abs to absolute directories and partition like crazy <laughs> and hope. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's on the right lines. I think uh, I think what Drew and Arash came up with was actually probably one of the most elegant uh, most elegant architectures that I've ever seen. Um, it's just there's just a, there's just a single server, and that was that was it. Uh, it doesn't you can't really make it any simpler than that. Um, and this is also why it's called the server team because it used to be called the server. Uh, as opposed to everything else. Um, so this is what... Huh? Work well with your user. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know the exact figures, uh, but it, was, it rounds approximately to zero. So, <laughs> uh, so this was uh, mid-2007 when Drew and Arash started the company together. Um, this one server was doing everything. It was running our application servers. It was running the... Uh, I, don't e I don't even know what web server they were running in front of it that was serving static content. It was running MySQL and it was storing all the data that anyone was putting on Dropbox on its local disks. Uh, <laughs> it's surprising, but yes, yeah, so that's uh, how it started. And it's not that they didn't know how to build better things. I mean, they're both MIT educated. They uh, have read all the interesting papers. They like know what's better out there, but this was a conscious choice that you know you start with what's most important, and it wasn't, you know, building out a complicated backend infrastructure. It's that they need to prove to themselves and everyone else that it was the right thing for them to quit their jobs and drop out of school and all of that stuff. Uh, so this is where, this is the humble beginnings of Dropbox. Um, so, say, so say you've gotten to this point, what would you do from here? What do you think, you know, you're Two guys working, I don't know why he likes to say this, but they like to say how they were working their boxers. Uh, <laughs> and you're coding away. And you, you, know, you want to get this company off the ground. What's the, what are the things that are most important for you to be improving about this picture? Because users. <laughs> <laughs> users. <laughs> OK. Um, I think the next slide also says approximately zero users because I didn't know how many there were. This but, was uh, 2007. Though. All they needed was view counts to get money. <laughs> 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 yeah. But so, so once once there are users, what's what's going to start breaking about this, or what what is going to be the most important and best usage of time? Because this is you know how you have to think when you're in this kind of environment. Reliability. Reliability probably uh, was not great because you need bandwidth. Bandwidth. Um, well, two oh, servers. The users. Yeah. <laughs> put your data on another box and put some web servers up front to handle it. And break it that way. Sorry. Moving off the data. Yeah, those are all those are all good things. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean th those all are things that happened. It turns out the things that happened first was, uh, first, the servers uh, ran out of disk space, so they had to put the data somewhere else. Um, and the second was that the server just became overloaded 
uh, and they had to move something off of it. Uh, so they chose to put all the data on Amazon S3, <laughs> and they decided to move the MySQL instance to a different box so that it could be, uh, they could be separated and run on separate hardware. Uh, and just for reference, this, um, this bottom part of the diagram is the clients. Uh, this, all people's computers are running Dropbox. Uh, this side is sort of our own machines. It used to be on managed hosting and now we're, it's self-hosted. And this side on the right is EC2, or AWS. Uh, for now, it's only S3. So uh, these are two somewhat controversial choices. I mean, not so much at the time, but now they're viewed as a little bit more controversial. You know, there's the whole MySQL versus NoSQL debate or whatever you want to call it. Um, the database is MySQL, by the way. Uh, and it, again, it's not that they didn't know that, you know, they could have written a custom database if, if they wanted to. They could have written their own custom key value store and run it on their own hardware, started like specking out new, uh, new machines that are like, optimized for our use cases and stuff like that. But, you know, there's only three people still at this point, and it wasn't clear at all that where this thing was going to go. Uh, so I, I personally believe that the choices of MySQL and S3 were extremely valuable, especially in the early stages. So uh, now it's getting a little bit harder. Can you guys figure out what uh, the next things are that are going to break? <laughs> Stop sending the files through the server to S3. Yeah. Sorry, and how would you do that? I don't know. That's the okay. magic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so um, that's actually, a, that is uh, one of the two things that had to be done next. That Well, first of all, just the capacity on the server eventually ran out. Uh, <laughs> and it would get to the point that, you know, downloading files would eventually push people out of being able to access the website. Uh, so they wanted to separate all the downloading and uploading functionality from all the sort of website and syncing functionality so that one, they wouldn't interfere with each other. And it was also one of the easier ways of, of splitting the, <laughs> the work into multiple servers. Um, the other thing that was fun at this time is you can see that there's only this arrow only goes in one direction, that the clients are only hitting the server. So uh, when there's new changes that happen, you have to, the client has to hit the server again, and that's called polling. These clients have to poll, sit in a loop, just poll the server every now and then. And uh, that's usually a, a bad thing. So uh, I mean, we could, you could play around with it. You could uh, increase the polling timeout to reduce load on the servers. You can decrease it to make it seem more responsive. but you know, you're still playing that game and you're only getting one out of the two. Um, so the, one of the next things that was done as well was add this new service called the notification servers or not servers that will start pinging the clients, will actually start pushing down notifications to them. And, uh, and the, the server was split into two web servers, one running in managed hosting and one running in AWS, where the one in AWS is hosting all the file content and accepting all the uploads. Uh, and the one in managed hosting is doing all the metadata calls. Uh, so they, they were called meta server and block server because our file data API is based around file blocks. Um, so this was early 2008. I think there are, uh, I guess, roughly 50,000 users at this time. Uh, Dropbox was in private beta. Uh, and I guess I'm not even going to, I won't try to ask what's going to happen because it's, it's too hard to know what the exact things are that are that's going to happen. I guess that's part of the point of this talk that, um, you know, it's very hard to, it's very easy to screw yourself by overbuilding because you don't even know what the things are that are going to fail. It's hard to look at something like this and know that the particular problems I'm about to mention are the ones that you're going to run into. Um, well, maybe some of them are, but you, you can't know that like, that's exactly what's going to happen. 
So the three things that had to change were that uh, obviously it looks we still have one of each of the meta servers and block servers. So we need to uh, add more of those. Uh, and that's a fairly standard operation. Uh, the second is a little bit more involved. You can see that the block servers are doing database queries directly to the database, because we just took the routes that were in the meta servers and moved them onto the block servers and set them up to do database qu calls from AWS, which was in Virginia, which is in Virginia, to uh, our managed hosting cluster, which was in uh, Texas. So you can imagine that doing a whole bunch of round-trip calls over that distance eventually gets to be uh, a bit of a, a latency bottleneck. So uh, instead of doing repeated round-trip calls to do multiple database queries, uh, we changed it so that, I, well, I guess there's a bunch of things you can do. You can make your MySQL usage a lot more sophisticated. You can start using stored procedures. You can write really complicated queries that like um, embed control flow logic and stuff in them. You can add more caching. You can uh, have a really complicated caching infrastructure. But these things are all a lot of work. And as a result, the thing that was decided on was uh, having the block servers do RPCs to the meta servers. Because then the meta server could sort of encapsulate all the logic of all the database calls that it needs to do. So uh, that was definitely the right way and the easiest way to handle that, though maybe not the most sophisticated. Uh, the third issue is we also only have one database in this context. Um, and there's, again, a bunch of ways that you can handle this that are sort of the standard or right way to deal with it. Uh, you can shard it. You can partition it. Um, but it turns out that it was just so much easier to add memcache and just cache everything, or not everything, but start caching the easy things to cache. And that just sort of let us avoid having, uh, having to deal with these really complicated database scaling issues. So doing all those three things, we ended up with uh, roughly this architecture at launch, where we uh, added a bunch of meta servers and block servers, put a load balancer in front of the meta servers, and added a memcache tier. And the block servers now do RPCs to the load balancers. Um, and so after this point, like the sort of base architecture uh, has been pretty stable. The problems now are that uh, there's still a bunch of things here that there's only one, one shape. And we need to get them to be stacks like the others. Um, so, so actually, our architecture today is basically the same, but with those things filled out. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff that's going on. There's, you know, there's their batch job running machines and stuff like that. But our fundamental architecture for, for providing sync is, uh, hasn't changed since uh, that time. Though adding, <laughs> making all of these into stacks is actually relatively difficult. It looks easy on, on the slide. You just kind of add more. <laughs> but uh, in practice, it's actually very difficult. Like every one of them, like even, even memcache, which you know it's designed to just you should you can just add more servers. The way we use it, um, because we have these really high consistency requirements, uh, we can't use. Uh, we had to modify the memcache library that we use, because most memcache libraries, when the server they try to hit is unavailable, they just move on to the next one. Uh, this is great for availability, because if one memcache server dies, you just start using another one. But it's really bad for consistency because one, one web server might think a memcache server is down, but another one thinks it's up. And so if you have any sort of complicated memcache protocols going on, uh, your servers are going to be cross-talking and not seeing each other. And you can get uh, cache inconsistencies. So we had to modify the memcache library for that. Um, the load balancing tier, again, is also supposed to be easy. but. Uh, that's actually interesting that it was tough because we use Python. It seems like those two things are unrelated, using Python and having difficulty scaling your memcache tier, or your load balancing tier. But uh, there's actually this feature, this feature uh, of Python called the global interpreter lock, which means uh, to a first approximation that 
you can only run one Python thread at a time. You can have multiple threads, but only one will be scheduled at a time, mostly. Uh, except for like, I mean, if one's doing I.O., then another one can come in, but you can't actually get true parallelism that much. Uh, so what this means is that for each web server, we want there to be exactly one request at a time. That adding a second request um, makes each request only proceed at 60% of the speed as a, f as a single request happening. And that sort of 20% improvement in throughput is just not worth it to us. Uh, so we want our load balancing tier to respect this. When you have one load balancer, it's easy. It just has all the state in it, and you tell it only one connection per web server. But when you have multiple, what, mo multiple load balancers, you can't really tell them to max out at one connection across the entire load balancing fleet. Uh, I mean, I guess you could, but there's no load balancing software out there that actually does this. Uh, so, you know, we had the option of either building our own load balancing software, and we could add that feature if we wanted to, or we could, uh, we could play some sort of complicated game, or we could, um, we could allow just one load balancer to die and just lose a whole bunch of capacity, uh, which <laughs> we did for a little while. Um, but the, the result we ended up with was we, uh, Every load balancer now has a pair, has a, has a, a hot, uh, hot backup. So if the, if the primary dies, it within a few seconds switches over to the backup. And this is done using some network level tricks. Um, and so this does mean that we have twice as many load balancers as we use, but in terms of work involved, it let us you know, get this high, availabil high availability load balancing cluster uh, much easier than, for instance, writing our own software for that. Uh, scaling the database tier is uh, probably one of the more standard of the difficult things to do. Um, that you can see a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about how do you build a distributed database, or how do you scale things, or how do you shard things well. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about that. But this was interesting. That you know, it wasn't just we started with nothing, no code, and had to design um, in a vacuum some sort of sharding scheme. It's people were actually using, using the database tier and building in the assumption that there's exactly one database into their code. And sometimes that's pretty obvious how they do that. You know, um, Putting in joins, it's obvious that they're like making the assumption that the two tables are in the same machine and joinable. Uh, having foreign key constraints, same deal. But there are certain assumptions you can make about MySQL usage that are not at all obvious. That, for instance, that a single transaction is a single transaction. Uh, in, sorry, I don't know. Uh, but once you move to a sharded environment, your transaction model changes. And it's not clear. You can't just look at a single piece of code and tell whether or not that line, that query, is assuming that it's running in a single transaction with all the other queries that it expects to run with. Uh, so this is, this is a kind of case where it's actually remarkably difficult to like, arrive at a solution that is much easier to build from scratch than to like, evolve your current system into. And we had to do a lot of work to like, hunt down all these cases um, where people had baked in these assumptions. The, uh, the not server tier was uh, also interesting. I guess it wasn't so much in terms of had to evolve it, but just because that system is so high throughput that there's, um, there are tens of millions of clients that are connected to the not servers at any point in time. Because we can't, you can't just uh, send a, a message to anyone on the internet due to firewalls and stuff like that. Uh, you have to let them connect to you, and then you can send messages down that connection. Uh, so the result is we have tens of millions of connections open to these not servers. And we're sending, um, I don't know, I forget the exact figure. We're sending a lot of notifications out at the same time. Um, so we actually had to add a, a two-level hierarchy for distributing all of this to all the not servers to then distribute to the clients. Because it was, it was just too expensive to uh, notify 100 not servers uh, 100 not server processes that they had to notify their clients. Sorry. 
So, uh, so this is where, the, as I said, the high-level architecture mostly stands today. Uh, are there any questions before I move on? Yeah. One of the things that you seem to have a huge advantage of, uh, and without saying you're anything like mega upload because you don't want to get your company shut down, but my files in general have nothing to do with your files, which makes there a very natural way to be sharding all this stuff in depth. Is there something not obvious that's going on behind the scenes that that's not the case? Uh, so in terms of the actual file data, we do uh, block level deduplication. So if you and I upload the same file on the back end, uh, in the storage tier of the back end, uh, it knows that they're the same and uh, it doesn't store more than one copy. Um, and a lot of things are fairly easily shardable, but a lot of th some things are not. Um, so shared folders makes it very hard because shared folders is something that cuts across users uh, and is actually something that like, we're actively trying to de decide how we want to shard. Because uh, this is something, um, for instance, the relationship table between users and um, shared folders that they're in uh, gets queried in both directions. Like Both for a user, you want to know all their shared folders. And for a shared folder, you want to know all the users. And both of those are queried a lot and have to always be exactly right. That uh, for various technical reasons, there's no, there's no room there for getting a wrong answer. Um, so this is currently not sharded, and we have to invest a fair amount of time once we do shard it to uh, get it like, exactly correct. What is, does that mean? Like is it block a file, or is it smaller than that? Uh, so what we do is we take a file, and we uh, divide it up into four megabyte chunks. And each chunk is a block in terms of deduplication. Um, so we take the hash of the chunk. And if two hashes are the same, then they get like mapped to the same object in S3. How big is your hash? Jeez. Uh, you know? Oh yeah, okay. I think it's SHA-256 then. Why did you just choose 4 megabyte chunks? Um, it's completely arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> worked pr pretty well so far. <laughs> Not like we, I don't know if we have the option to change it. Cool. Any other questions? So what kind of deduplication are you, are you seeing across your users? How much of it? Yeah. How much deduplication? Um, I think we've, have we ever determined this? I think we've run it. Uh, so you have to have another sort of reference to which you're comparing to measure how much you're saving. Uh, and depending on where you set that reference in terms of like only deduplicating within a single account, for instance, uh, I believe it's double digit percentage. I'm not 100% sure. Cool. Any other questions? All right. You do uh, deduplication on the of sub blocks on the upsend to. You, do you send just deltas to the block server, or do you send the whole thing? Um, so I believe that it is smart that if it believes that. Uh, a file is only a small, if the client believes that the file is only a small modification away from the old file, we'll actually use like an rsync diff uh, and upload that to the server. Um, I'm not fully aware of all those details though. How, how often does the client pull the, ser the servers? Uh, well, it used to be, I think, once a minute, but now that we have the not servers, um, and also now that we have tens of millions of clients, uh, polling would just crush us. Uh, <laughs> which is actually funny because sometimes we didn't ha used to have good like back offs. So when the site would go down, oh, the clients geez. would DDoS us. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but that's, we improved that a lot. But now, now they don't pull at all um, because <coughs> they just connect to the not servers. So they just keep the connection open all the time? Yeah. Yeah, they long pull the not servers. And then when we have a notification for them, it uh, it sends that down.
What, what kind of uh, connection count are you getting on a NOT server these days? Um, I believe a single NOT server machine. We were, we were running them at 1 million connections per machine. Uh, they started. It was memory. Yeah, uh, limited memory. memory. Just well, we didn't actually hit a limit. They started failing uh, because we hit a, a kernel bug, which, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I have time, I can talk about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it's at least a million. We're not really sure where it is. These things are not fun to like push super hard because no. um, even though a single machine can have a million connections open, it can't open a million connections in any reasonable amount of time. So, uh, so once they go down, they're very hard to bring back up, uh, and we don't want to like push them too close to the limit. Is your deduping on a per user basis, or say in a media case, do you have a media file that many users may have in there? Uh, so at the storage level, it's globally across the uh, entire service. Um, there are, that doesn't mean that if you put a file in your Dropbox, and that will necessarily instantly upload given that it's already on Dropbox, though. So, there are other things involved in deciding that. So some servers on Amazon and some servers are managed hosting. How do you decide what to put in Amazon and what to put with your own hosting? Sure, so at this point, um, it's basically anything that has to touch the actual file data lives in Amazon and otherwise it lives on our own servers. That, uh, is, I mean, it's great to co-locate our servers with the actual data when it needs it, but otherwise it's more, it's more cost efficient, it's easier to manage and all of that when it's like our own hardware that we're actually running. Um, because all our, all our EC2 instances are on 24-7, uh, so we're sort of missing out on some of the best features of EC2, uh, so it makes more sense to just kind of run them ourselves. Uh, at this point, it's, uh, I think it's only block servers. Every now and then we do certain analyses of certain like, subsets of data, and that will also run in EC2. Do you have estimates for how much it costs you to run on Amazon as compared to doing it yourself? Um, more. I think that's <laughs> probably all I'm I, I should say. Uh, but, I mean, you can see that we're still on Amazon, um, and we haven't yet made the decision to move off of them. How many operations people do you have for your side of the line? Uh, How many people so have pagers? <laughs> <laughs> there are, I think, it's one, six of us. Yeah, six of us. Um, well, I guess we also have a network guy, so I guess that would make seven. <laughs> Is your customer base worldwide, or is it mostly the United States? And the real question is, are you using the Amazon distributed cloud, or you got it all in Virginia still? Uh, everything is in Virginia. Um, I don't know the exact percentage that's international, but I think it's the majority is international at this like point. 65. 65% international usage. Um, so yes, we do, uh, we do serve all the data out of Virginia. We do serve all the metadata out of um, San Jose now. Huh. Uh, and I guess this is another another point that, you know, obviously we we obviously know that you know if you want better performance, you go international and you figure that out. But um, one thing that we've been able to get away with is uh, since the, the client behavior is all asynchronous and sort of user invisible, uh, it's not hugely performance sensitive. Uh, not that we sort of just neglect performance, but uh, it's not been something, we're not quite under the same uh, specter of performance that like a web only site would be where, I forget what the numbers are, but we, you know, I, we all see the like stats that if you increase page load time by X percent, your whatever return rate goes up. But um, so we get, to, we get to be a little bit more candid, uh, a little bit more relaxed about that. How, how many copies of data do you store for user in S3? We just store, uh, Amazon takes care of the replication and all of that, so we just upload it once. Um, you would have to ask them about what they do internally. Do you get hammered by that recent Amazon problem, or what did it affect your server? 
But the S3 went down. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. sure we would. <laughs> okay. um, you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We do see, uh, I mean, at this scale, you do see interesting things happening on Amazon's side. Um, I mean, they're, they're pretty competent over there, but uh, it's just interesting to watch it from our side. Do you have a feel for what fraction of the S3 usage you are? <laughs> I, I wish I knew. Um, they I, only release one stat publicly. I don't think you should say it. What? I actually have a pretty good sense of it from some stuff. But oh, okay. In that's terms of publicly released. Yeah, when the camera goes off. Yeah, when the camera goes off. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. good. Yeah. When the camera's off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We might do that then. Spend a talk for a few minutes about your evolution of instrumentation. What did you do when you were two guys, <laughs> two guys in boxers, and what do you have now? Yeah, so, um, okay, so at this point, uh, instrumentation and debugging and monitoring is pretty easy. <laughs> There's this great tool that's already written. It's called Top. You, uh, you go to the server, you run Top. Uh, and that got, that got us to here. <laughs> um, maybe, actually, actually, a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, the service is pretty regular, and it's like you build up a good intuition about what's going wrong when certain things happen. Um, but it was basically, uh, we went for a long time without building out like graphing um, and trending of metrics and stuff like that. Uh, and we have all that now, so it's like much better. But uh, you know, it, it worked without it for quite a while. What, what do you have now? What, what what metrics do you watch? What metrics do you, you, do you monitor? Yeah, um, we watch all the servers load. We watch um, how many requests are happening from all the different channels per second. Uh, we watch the breakdown for um, for important requests. Uh, what's the breakdown in time that went into that request? So if it takes a hundred milliseconds to uh, to commit new files, that's you know. 40 milliseconds of CPU time on the web server. That's 30 milliseconds talking to uh, the metadata server. That's 20 milliseconds like dealing with memcache or something. Uh, so we can see over time how that how that varies. If one of them spikes with a code push, then we know that uh, that's something to look into. If it uh, if you know the site goes down and we see that that those things are changing, that gives us a lot of good uh, insight into what's going wrong. Um, we track bandwidth as measured by users. Uh, there's, there's a ton, I guess. Yeah. What are you doing for uh, security and encryption? Just like to make sure that, like, if you type in a random password, you can't read everyone's files. <laughs> 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 Like that was not a super specific question. Well, but I guess just in general. I mean, like, what have you done to like, like, there was this problem with Dropbox a while ago. Like, what have you, like, what were you doing then that didn't work, and what have you done now to like keep that sort of thing from, like, like where are things encrypted and decrypted? And, like, sure. So I mean, I what, can't. What's the risk? Of <laughs> uh, I can't talk too much about any specific uh, thing that has happened, um, though I can say that just. In general, we take security and privacy very seriously and respond very aggressively whenever something does happen. Um, in general, uh, yeah, I guess there's, sorry, there's not a whole lot I can go into right now, uh, but we can maybe talk afterwards or something. Uh, I'm going to go into the next example. Um, so the next example is going to be diving a little bit deeper into one of the uh, aspects of the system, uh, the database tier. And in particular, uh, diving into how we store all the metadata about your Dropbox. So uh, the, way we, the way we store um, what the metadata for what you have in your Dropbox is as a log of all the edits that has happened to it. Uh, so whenever you, your client notices changes 
it uploads those changes to the meta servers, which record them in this log. Uh, and this is called the server file journal. I believe there's also a, a client side version of this as well, which is why it's called the server file journal. Um, so this is a abridged schema of server file journal. This is the original one that we started with, uh, or the earliest one that I could find at least. Um, and it's only including the sort of interesting fields in it. So uh, it's, it has an ID field, which is just the index in the log. It has the file name, something called case path that I don't know what it is. Um, latest, which means is it like, <coughs> is it the latest entry in the log for that file? Uh, and NSID, which stands for namespace ID, where a namespace is either your your Dropbox or a shared folder, so that every uh, every namespace has its own log associated with it. Um, the one interesting thing is the primary key is the ID. Um, we're using MySQL and in particular InnoDB here. So what this means is that uh, on disk things are ordered by ID. That's that's what uh, the primary key means. So it's very fast to scan things in ID order. Uh, any other order is not as fast, even if you have an index on it. Um, and writing thing, appending things in ID order is extremely fast. Uh, appending it in any other order is not as fast. Though in this case, uh, it's in this case everything was being appended in ID order. Um, so there's a bunch of things that changed over time. I don't even. Uh, know why this change was made, but one of the first things that was done was getting rid of case path. Um, I, I think originally it was to deal with some case sensitivity issues, and then the, um, the protocol or the sort of the interface between the client and server was changed so that uh, my guess is that the clients now take care of any case sensitivity issues rather than the server. Um, or, or that the logic is, is not put in MySQL and we're not storing that anymore. So this is a case of our requirements changing over time or just like, you know, iterating on what we started out with. Uh, the next thing, this. The next thing that happened was, um, my guess, I wasn't here at the time, my guess is that they didn't used to have, we didn't used to have the feature of you could click on a file and see all the past revisions of it. Uh, this is actually, with this schema, kind of expensive to do. You have to search the entire, file, the entire log of everyone's Dropboxes uh, looking for the right NSID and file name. And then you can list those as a, uh, as a list of revisions. Uh, so to make this faster, because this was a new feature that we wanted to make more efficient, we added a new field called PrevRev, which I believe points to the ID of the previous entry that of that file. Uh, so this was added because we added a new feature. The next thing was um, the performance of the system started to get pretty bad. That you know it was all in one machine, and this log was getting very big. That it, it works fine if you have like a small number of users, but after a while it doesn't make any sense to mix everyone's updates together. It's not very efficient to find a single person's, uh, a single person's updates. So the primary key was changed to this. Uh, so what this means is first, things are sorted by NSID. So everything within a, an NSID is grouped together. Then latest, uh, so that means that there's two sections of the log, one that is sort of previous entries and one that is all your sort of current active state of your Dropbox. And then ID to sort of sort it into essentially timestamp order uh, and have a log, log of that. So this, uh, I think this was pretty good for a while. Um, and at this point, the, uh, the functionality was pretty much set. Uh, and the sort of major performance was done that, you know, I think this was, uh, roughly 2008 at this point, not 100% sure. And at this, 
and at this point, it starts m to make sense to sort of go over this very carefully and make some careful optimizations to it. So the next thing that was done was file name was changed from a 260 length string to a 255. Um, it seems like a kind of random thing to do that if you don't, if you don't know anything less than a lot of about MySQL, uh, it might, it's not clear at all why this would happen. But it turns out that actually MySQL stores varchars uh, with size at most 255 more efficiently than with a size larger than that. Uh, because with 255, you only need one byte for the length. And I'm not sure what it does if it's greater than 255, but it uses more bytes to store the length. Um, so this was a pretty easy win in terms of, I mean, it was easy in terms of once you know that you had to do it, uh, it was easy. But it was just one of those like reading the manual, taking the time to actually do that, taking time away from building features actually started to make sense. I think around the same time, um, all these fields were declared not null because that also saves another byte per, uh, per field. Uh, the next thing that was done was a little bit more subtle and that was getting rid of latest in the, in the primary key. So instead of having two sections of the log, one that is the active files and one that is inactive, they're all mixed together. Uh, this makes it, the reason that it was originally in the primary key is because that makes it more efficient for writing or s for reading because all the files that you're interested in are together. You don't have to skip over deleted entries uh, to get to the ones that you're actually interested in. But this means that when you write new things to your Dropbox, you have to shuffle things around in your log a lot. So this was, so this change, uh, it's subtle in that it optimizes for writes at this expense of reads. And given that we do so many writes, that's actually a very good thing for us because, um, I don't know, it's somewhat, people say, and you can take their word for it or not, that writes are harder to scale than reads. And especially that we have, s because we have so many, this is an interesting trade-off for us to be making. Um, and at this point, I think this is mostly where the, uh, the schema lies today. Cool. So are there any questions, comments about this? Yeah. I'm wondering when you, you know, say I really want to delete something, is there any kind of compaction or just guarding old data or anything involved with this? Or do they just grow? Um, in normal usage, they just grow. I'm not sure if there's any times that we, uh, I, I don't know about like otherwise though, but. Did you have to change the size of ID at some point? Uh, no, bec well, now that IDs are per user or per namespace, uh, we haven't had an issue that we do have more than uh, 4 <coughs> billion entries. So if that wasn't true, then yes, we would have had to increase that. Um, but it's per, it's per namespace, so it's not an issue. It went from being unique to not unique at one point mm. in the history of the system. So do you have a test bed where you can go measure these things and see if the proposed change actually makes a difference? Uh, it's actually extremely hard to test these kinds of things. Um, I mean, you can test that it's correct, but it's very hard to generate realistic workloads on these kinds of things. Um, there's some simple things we can do uh, where we can actually run a production workload on a production <coughs> box. Uh, it's still hard to like make that work. Um, I think these changes all happened a while ago, so I'm not 100% sure what went into them. Uh, yeah, these days, really the only way to, if you really want good precision on whether or not a change will be helpful is to uh, test it in prod. Um, and it's just too hard to sort of generate uh, realistic data <coughs> and workflows. Do you do A-B testing when you bring up a new build, a canary, and 
take some part of the load and watch then migrate over into a product? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we're increasing our usage of <coughs> stage rollouts and uh, A-B testing and all that kind of stuff. It's um, the only way to find out. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't really stage roll out something like this, uh, at least not very easily. Uh, we're sort of increasing our ability to do operational changes <coughs> incrementally. Uh, but at least on a single table, it's kind of all or nothing whether or not you do this. Uh, I mean, so from a product standpoint, we can do that. But from a, from a database, it's very hard. I think the, um, the interesting things about this evolution is that we've seen, especially with the primary key changes, we've seen massive changes in the performance characteristics of this table over time with uh, what is a very small amount of text to uh, change the primary key. I mean, MySQL has to do a lot of work, and you have to be careful about telling MySQL to do it. But uh, con conceptually, it's not very much work to you to actually go and make a very fundamental change in how this is architected. Um, so, so personally, when it comes to the MySQL versus NoSQL debate, I'm very much glad that we have stuck with MySQL because we can sort of pivot on, on the fly and change the performance characteristics without having to like, completely re-architect our usage of a certain table or anything like that. Uh, n not that it's not hard with MySQL, but it's something that's not necessarily even possible with other solutions. Cool. So um, those are the two main examples that I had. Um, and just quickly to close this up, um, I think one of the main themes that I've definitely noticed and hopefully was evident in the two examples is how valuable it is to sort of use your time effectively. That that's sort of the key constraint here that, you know, if we had 10,000 engineers then yes, we would just build Google's infrastructure and go with that or whatever, build an improved version of it. Uh, but we don't. And that's, that's why we had to make all these changes that we did or all these choices that we did. Uh, we always know that there's something better that we could be doing. Uh, and, and it's interesting because you can trade your time for other things fairly easily. You can trade it for more users. You can trade it for money. You can trade it for future time by recruiting, but you can't really trade other things back for time that easily. You can like not make your room, you can clean your room, you can uh, not do your laundry. Um, I think some of our co-founders are big fans of those two things. <laughs> um, but once you do those things, there's only a limit to how much you can like not do those things. And at some point, you know, your time is just the constraint that you have to decide how you want to turn it into other things. Uh, and hopefully some of this sort of showed that to you. And the other reason why um, I brought all these things up and wanted to do this talk is because this isn't just a talk about our history. This is like still our mentality. This is still where we are. We're still fast growing. We're still having to make all these trade-offs that we know all these things that we could be building, but we know that we have fewer people than we want. Uh, and so here, these are just some examples of decisions that we're currently going through that like exhibit some of the same properties that we want to have some sort of batch processing infrastructure that can um, run jobs over our metadata. And you know, if you, if you just sit down and think about what's the best way to do it, you could say, oh, let's import it into Hadoop and then run some sort of like automated batch job system on top of that and then have some sort of web service that like displays the results and emails you and stuff like that. Um, but this can get, you know, that's a lot of work to set that all up. Uh, instead, some of the things that we can do, we found a much more elegant way and simpler way of including a lot of that inside the request workflow um, that, you know, we didn't have to add any additional architecture for that. And we're getting a lot of the benefits with a lot less work. A similar thing is, uh, you know, server file journal. Um, it's currently stored on SAS hard drives. So they're kind of, I think they're the fastest hard drives that you can get that are actually disks that are spinning. Uh, 
but now there's SSDs, and SSD prices are plummeting, not plummeting, but they're decreasing over time. And it's no longer sort of a slam dunk that if you have a lot of data, you have to put it on spinning media. So uh, maybe the next evolution of server file journal, rather than like re-architecting it at a MySQL level, will just be we buy a whole bunch of SSDs and put it on that instead. If we can save you know months and months of engineer time by doing that, then maybe that makes sense. So these are both things that we haven't done yet, but sort of but show the same kinds of decisions being made. And the rest of the talk was sort of um, background for how we think about these things in general. So uh, that's it for uh, what I have prepared. And if you guys have any more questions, I can take those now. Yeah. As you look forward, what are the next things that you're thinking are going to be your biggest challenges? Since data doesn't have any predators, really, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, you mean as a company as opposed to, like, for instance, as a back end? Um, so, I mean, we want to just, we always want to be get bigger. We want to appeal to more people. We want more people to be happy to be using us all the time. Um, that's always a goal. We can always, like, have more people be using us. Um, but the ultimate goal is that, you know, you're, you don't have to think about where your data is. Um, I shouldn't have had to think about the fact that <laughs> the data was on this laptop for the presentation, and if I couldn't get this laptop to work with the projector system, then it just wasn't going to work. Um, it should just be, <coughs> that's my data, that's my presentation, and anywhere that I can present it, I can just hook up to my Dropbox account and have it like show that presentation. Uh, I should be able to take pictures with my phone, and I guess I wouldn't be putting them on the projector, but maybe like at home, on my TV, I could just get them on there. Um, so these things, like, this is how technology should work, but it doesn't currently. So we want to start building all of this stuff out. Um, in the near term, that means, like, uh, better mobile clients, uh, more API usage, and stuff like that. You guys have anything that you want to add to that? Are you discouraging people from using the service? actually as a backup, like against Carbonite or something like that. I mean, it's really a data service right now, documents or anything. But you could back up the system. Yeah, uh, probably people do. I don't know if we have any information about how many people do, but uh, no. I'm personally at least happy that people have found a productive way to use Dropbox. Yeah. Kind of the flip side, if they're actually sharing folders and making public documents, there's a, a risk they're using it for copyright infringement and certain authorities frown upon that. Um, how do you, I mean, to some extent, some of the services that have been shut down do exactly the same thing. How are you, as a business, defending against becoming sort of a transporter or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, so I mean, I don't have all the information on that, um, but I mean, we do have in our uh, we do sort of explicitly, I think, prohibit uh, well. this kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, whatever, I'm sure all the, the legal sites do as well. But, um, and then we also do, you know, um, we do follow the whole DMC takedown stuff that we have to, uh, I guess, I haven't fully, like, kept track with, like, what's going on that. So I don't want to, like, say anything for fear of, like, being wrong here, uh, but I do know that like we do take that stuff very seriously. People are paying for this, or is it ad supported? Uh, I think it's almost all user subscriptions. Okay, you uh, get a small account for free, but if you want to really use it, you pay yeah, for typically hundred dollars. But, but that gives you months. two great yeah. advantages. Yeah. One yeah. is yeah. that you don't have a great <coughs> privacy fight because you're not selling my seat, my information to advertisers. And the other is that the, the, the spammers aren't going to pay for an account when they can find a free one someplace else. Yeah, yeah. Um, that doesn't stop them from trying. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so that we do have systems in place to try to like detect sort of abuse and all of that stuff. Um, 
I work with a consulting operation. We have about seven different locations in the United States, and we're always using Dropbox to move the files between the different PowerPoint presentations. Reports yeah, it's good. You've got business accounts, too, where you get the large amount of space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know what we... My account costs $100 a year. I don't know how much room I have on it. Yeah, we have an enterprise product that... Uh, Again, I don't know a whole lot about what it offers, but I know it does offer some features that like are more appealing to the enterprise market. The only frustrating thing, and I'll be on the phone to the guy and say, oh, I just dropped it in the Dropbox. And I said, it's still not there. Still <laughs> not there. <laughs> well, <laughs> Can't you email it? Well, it's 50 megs. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on increasing the speed of light, but it's taking a while. Want to buy some used neutrinos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, that brings up something I was thinking about on the way here, is that if I'm in Japan, Korea, something like that, I've got like 100 megabits in my house, it must be a very different user experience. For me, I mean, I upload my family photos, and it's like tomorrow I'll go get them somewhere else. Whereas there, I would expect this almost instantaneous behavior, and, we're in, and you're shipping it to Virginia. Is that yeah, so um, we don't have a whole lot of uh, metrics in terms of breaking down by geography, like what the bandwidth speeds are. Um, one interesting thing, as I mentioned, client behavior is a little bit more tolerant of latency. Right. Um, but those countries also are the ones that have a lot of smartphone <coughs> usage. And that um, is on demand as opposed to a syncing <coughs> behavior. So we're seeing this like change in requirements on the back end that rather than being uh, latency tolerant is becoming, I guess, less latency tolerant over time. Cool. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, who, are you, uh, who are the main competitor, competitors of your company, and uh, how do you think about like, box.com? Um, yeah, so, so box.net uh, is currently in the enterprise space. Um, and I mean, as a whole, our strategy is to build the best product that we can and best services that we can, um, and not get distracted too much by what other people are doing. Uh, but yes, I mean, other people are doing what we're doing and interested in doing it if they're not already. Um, and there's not, you know, there's not a whole lot we can do other than just like continuing to move fast and build the best things we can. I think we're all waiting to do the camera off and do the cool stuff. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Let's turn it off and fade to black. Fade to black and do the and uh, talk about the stuff we can't talk about online. All right. <laughs>